Hello everyone. Please welcome Nemanja Nedeljković. Hello guys. Hello guys, thanks for being here. Uh, this is my first presentation ever, so don't mind if I am a bit slow with, uh, with the process. Today I'll be talking about RFID access control systems, how they work and uh, what are the most common vulnerabilities in them. Uh, a little bit about me. I am Nemanja, I also go by Nemanja N00. I like to take things apart, but as most of you here, I don't always put them back together. <laughs> Uh, I do reverse engineering, DevOps, and R&D at Constellation, and I would like to thank my colleagues for being here. They were awesome, and they helped me a lot with uh, completing this presentation. Also, they had to listen it for a few times, so thank you also for that. For that. Uh, first, I'll uh, talk a little bit about presentation, and then I will continue to verify this stuff. Uh, in scope, the stuff that in scope, oh fuck, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't curse ever. You should have used Windows, right? <laughs> yeah, Linux doesn't always work for stuff like that. Of course, I killed the wrong window. <laughs> yeah, it's okay now. Uh, I'll be talking about... Are we talking about? Uh, I'll be talking about RFID credentials, RFID readers, Vigand, which is protocol that is used for communication between uh, uh, reader and uh, controller, and high-level uh, control overview since they are all a lot different than each other because of proprietary implementations. And I'll be talking about integrator and manufacturer mistakes and uh, why they don't give a fuck about security. Uh, what is out of scope? Uh, magnetic tapes, because they are pretty, pretty old. Biometrics, because they require newer protocols that are uh, not yet adopted properly. OSDP, which is replacement for vegan that is, as already said, not adopted. And I will, I will not be talking about business logic in controllers. Uh, I would describe that as, for example, being able to disable credentials after work hours and stuff like that. That is completely implemented differently in each controller and that's why it's out of scope. Uh, first we'll talk about architecture of uh, RFID system. We have a card, reader and a controller. A controller takes uh, care of unlocking doors, reader as it's obviously from the name, reads the credentials, and we have a card. Uh, sorry. Uh, there's something uh, we call as grab technique, uh, and we call it th that way because uh, it gets us in to a weird position so while you are trying to read somebody creden somebody's credentials. For example, you go behind somebody and like, try to read the, the card from his back pocket. Uh, cards are really, really diverse and pretty much the only thing that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, the only thing that's same for all of them is that they have a unique ID. And even that is not always the case. We talk about that later. Uh, they are not even the same length, like if you have different uh, manufacturing, different standard implementations, even the length of the ID is not the same. Uh, when, when we get back to unique part, there's, uh, there are some magic cards or backdoor cards from Chinese manufacturers that can have ID changed. And that's problematic because a lot of uh, systems use only ID for uh, identification, so it's sometimes trivial to clone cards. 
In terms of how they are powered, they are active and uh, passive uh, cards. Active cards are uh, powered by battery that's inside of them and they are mostly used for uh, uh, garages and uh, tools and stuff like that. And uh, passive cards are mostly the cards that we use for access control, for entering the building, uh, apartment, whatever. Uh, in terms of frequency, they are LF, HF and UHF cards. Only NF and HF cards are used for uh, entering the buildings and UHF cards are mostly used for garages, for uh, uh, paying a toll for uh, inventory systems. Like for example, if you were ever in a H&M, you've probably seen that they have uh, a sticker on their uh, tags that's uh, UHF uh, RFID tag. Uh, powering card. Uh, if you remember physics from school, there's something called electromagnetic in induction, uh, and uh, it happens when either conductor moves in a magnetic field or when conductor is in alternating uh, electromagnetic field. Uh, we'll show a demo of that now in just a second. Uh, what I have here is a Proxmark 3 and it has ability to turn on the field and measure the voltage inside of that field, measure the voltage across antenna. HF tune, mix. What I have here is uh, basically antenna with one LED on it, as you can see it lights up and as I put it near the field or in better, uh, better contact with antenna, voltage decreases. That's the proof of uh, uh, of uh, card being powered by by LF antenna. Sorry, just a second. And how is that used? We have a source of uh, alternating current. That's at the frequency uh, that card needs to, to be powered. And we also have resonant antenna. A resonant antenna means it's effective at that frequency or that it resonates uh, the, the field from it. Uh, it's the length of resonant antenna depends on of wavelength of uh, the, the alternating current signal. Uh, wavelength is the length light travels in during one uh, cycle. So we have a sinusoid and during one, uh, one uh, sinusoid uh, uh, oscillation, we have uh, uh, light travel time and uh, the, the, that uh, travel is the, the length of antenna. A lower frequency means a bigger antenna, so for high frequency uh, cards, uh, we, we have smaller antennas that can lead, read from lo longer distances. Uh, in this case, I put uh, antenna for LF card in front of the reader and here's the, the reading from oscilloscope. As you can see we have something that resembles a sinusoid signal. Of course in, uh, in practice it's never a perfect signal. No worries. Uh, the way the reader sends data to card is really simple. It uses a capacitor for card. Uh, there is a capacitor inside of card that's used in order to uh, preserve some energy so card can stay awake and we disable for one or more cycles the power that's sent from the reader. So basically uh, card measures uh, voltage over antenna and when it detects a drop in voltage then it uh, measures the time until field is back on and depending on how long it has been uh, it uh, decodes zero or one. Uh, data modulation card to reader. Uh, I'll show you the demo of how the, the data is modulated from the card to reader.
I just need. As you can see, there's. Sorry about this. There's a. Uh, there's a voltage that's changing in value and uh, the there, there are bits that are zero and one and that th they look different in the in the graph sorry To get started, it is sometimes hard to see the difference between LF and HF cards, and we need to know which type of card we are working with in order to be able to properly clone it. In this picture, I have uh, how cards look when we shine light through them, and it is obvious, uh, obvious uh, which kind of card it is. You just need a stronger flashlight and a card, and if you shine a light through it, you'll be able to see either a square antenna that's going all the way to the edges of the card or around the antenna that is in the middle of the card. LF cards. LF cards are really simple in how they work. They have mostly only one-way communication or sometimes really, really stupid two-way communication like really, really simple commands, for example, to read some part of the memory and that's it. It is really slow due to low frequency and has mostly no security features, no encryption, no authentication, and uh, like no, uh, no, no smart uh, commands that can be sent to them. Uh, they have really simple implementation, as I said, and there's, they mostly vary in only the two things, modulation, baud rate, and if signal is inverted or not, so it is really easy to, to read them and to clone them. These are some of the standards of the cards, but they are really uh, the two ones that are really interesting for you. It is T5577 because it can uh, emulate other types of the cards and it can be configured with different types of modulation, baud rate, uh, ID length, and stuff like that. And there are also animal chip tags, and these are the two standards that are shown on the screen. If you have a cat, a dog, or any other variety of the animal, I don't judge. Uh, they, they probably have uh, some of these two cards. Vulnerabilities of, or, and characteristics of LF cards. As I said, they are really trivial to read because all you have to do is to demodulate the signal they are sending. They are trivial to clone or emulate because, uh, as I said, there's really not much variety in them and they are cards that implement all of the, the, the different techniques of modulation. And uh, they require a larger antenna f for any kind of longer range reading. Uh, the, the, the longest that uh, we can probably demonstrate with open source stories is like seven to eight centimeters. Uh, tools that are commonly used for LF cards are, as already mentioned, Proxmark. This is the, the late, latest version, but uh, there are some older versions that are cheaper, and I re recommend those for beginners. That ca they can be found on AliExpress. They are clones, but it is the version that is not produced anymore, so in my opinion, it is, it is not morally questionable to buy them. Uh, from China, we also have blue and white cloner. And uh, can you guess? out of those two, for example, which one is the white cloner. Uh, there, there are no real recognizable features on them, no like factory name or anything like that. They are just, you, you just like search blue or white cloner. Th these are really trivial. For example, you just take the card, you press scan button, you take another card, you press 
right and that's it like no 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 like advanced features that can be good or bad uh, what's bad about uh, this cloner the white one is that it uh, locks the card so if you have t5577 it sets the password after changing id so you're not able to program that card with something else and that is something that fucked up a lot of implants some people like me have implants in hand and if they use a white cloner, they are fucked like they can change their implant ID. <laughs> so th there are like people developing exploits to, to try to bypass <laughs> password just because there are like people around like with implant in their hand that, that doesn't do anything. Uh, the shitty thing about white cloner is that it doesn't have a display so you're cloning a card but you don't know if it works you don't know what idea it is you can't write it down you have to like if you want to make another copy you have to like save all the cards somewhere and use them later to, to copy you you can enter id on uh, on white cloner one thing that i recommend to anybody getting into rfid is to buy one of these it is just a simple label maker but it'll save you a lot of time <laughs> when you buy cards you just print uh, print the type of the card and put it on them because later in life you'll probably end up with something like this like a lot of cards and no idea which one does what Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, we have Tiny Lab Kissy, which is the the proprietary solution, but fr not from China. This is it. It is a really simple solution. Uh, what it can do is either clone, or sorry, emulate one of four cards. So you take it. You take card you long press the button and the next time you press that button it will emulate the that card uh, only downside of this uh, device is that if your reader requires cards to be in in a field present for longer than like a half of the second it will not work because it like emulates the card the moment you press it and then disables the the, the emulation to save the battery what it can also do is write the ID that is in one of the slots to a card, uh, but the issue is that with that is that they have a DRM uh, on the device, and it, it will only write on the cards made by them. Uh, and, uh, in a way, that's like for them uh, protection for them from somebody like using these devices to mass clone cards. But if you have like ten cards uh, that are magic that can change ID, you can DM the the maker on uh, Discord and he'll make you uh, signatures for your cards so you can use your cards with uh, Kill Abstinci, which is really cool. Uh, there's also a newcomer to the to the field of FireID, it's Chameleon Ultra. It is really new but it promises a lot. Right now it only supports the most common uh, standard AM4100. Uh, but they pl plan to implement a lot no more features and uh, since one of the recent versions you can press a button on the chameleon and just scan the card and later approach with the device to the scanner and, and it will work Sorry for not preparing it. This is how it looks like. It is really small, so if you want to see it closely, you can come later and and see it. By the way, most of the things will be in on one of the tables outside. Uh, if anybody wants to learn anything about RFID, I'll be there. So please come. Uh, we also have Flipper Zero, which a lot of you have probably heard about, maybe even have it. Looks like this, and it is really good. Uh, when it comes to reading LF and emulating LF cards. Uh, I have only had the issue with reader not accepting it like once. 
By the way, you'll, you'll hear me talk about uh, talk a lot about experiences. Uh, we, the RFID guys, are in a way really weird because every time we see a reader, we try to do something with it because it takes a lot of money to buy readers, so we'll just play with like some, t some random readers on the street or something like that. A lot of hotel cards, as, as this guy said. And of course, I'm on the wrong slide. <laughs> also, there's uh, this, whole, this thing called uh, iCopix, which had a lot of con controversy about it. The main reason being uh, that it uses uh, Proxmark firmware and uh, doesn't disclose the modifications made to it. It is made by Nikola Tesla uh, Labs from China, of course. <laughs> why, why not? <laughs> Uh, what they did, what they did is they created a GUI wrapper around the Proxmark client, and it pretty much tells you what to do. You scan the card; it tells you tells you which card from their pack you should use. Like they have, they have cards that are wrong. <laughs> I think this is the one, yeah, Nikola Tell Labs. They have all, all the cards labeled it and it will pretty much tell you what should be written on the card. You find that card and it will copy the, the card to, to it. HF cards, now the strange part. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the time you'll hear people talk about NFC. And there's not really one type of like NFC card. It's a lot of different standards. There's like NFC uh, A, NFC F, NFC V. It's, it, it can get like really over, over, all overwhelming fast. Like my English, for example. <laughs> they have a fast communications. They are really flexible in terms of features. So you have you will find like uh, cards that do really strange stuff. For example, that they, they're like uh, PGP or GPG implementations of applets for uh, some smart Java cards and you can use them to sign your email. That's really not something you would expect from the cards that can be also used for uh, identification to the door controller. Uh, vulnerabilities and characteristics. Uh, they are really a lot more advanced in terms of features that, and that means uh, they are really, really hard to... Uh, that re it's really hard to implement a reader that can read all of them. Uh, they support like proprietary communication protocols. They are sometimes encrypted, sometimes programmable like Java smart card. At least we have like a reliable way to talk to them, but we don't always know what the commands are on them. Uh, readers do not always use uh, proprietary features of the card. So if you have like a card that has some Java applet implemented on it that stores credentials in some crazy secure way, you can probably also buy a reader that's, that, that is going to only use the ID of that card and it won't care about any security features. So it's like, it, it doesn't matter always how secure the card is unless the reader is also really, really secure. Uh, ca cards can be uh, cloned, but uh, only if we have implementation of that card that can be manual, uh, that can be manipulated. For example, they are like uh, in in Cell, like me for a classic cards that can have their ID altered, that have intentionally bad uh, random number generators implemented, and those can be used to create the clones of me for classic cards. Uh, higher frequency means longer range read. We have this device that's made in Serbia. And what they basically did is took insane amplification of the signal and created huge antenna. And this reader can be like put in the bag and he, it can read cards from like 20, 30 centimeters. So if you don't mind being like weird and coming like this to, 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 to people, it can steal their credentials. <laughs> yeah. 
it's not connected. Uh, no, it's really not connected. Uh, this time we have uh, different standards from uh, for uh, modulation and different standards for, for communication with cards. Because cards have two-way communication, uh, they are really advanced standards, uh, how to send commands, how to decode the data, how to check if that is correct, because we have checksums, uh, if something fails, we don't want to have a chain fail. And uh, even there's a implementation of, of how to talk to smart cards. If you have ID with a chip or a payment card or something like that, this utilizes something that's called APDU protocol and there's the implementation of APDU over the over the RFID. That standard is called ISO 7816. Uh, for RFID communication, the most common standard that we encounter is uh, ISO 1443. Uh, it has two varieties, A and B, and A is the really the, the, the most popular one. Also, we have ISO 15693, and that standard was introduced in order to have cards that have a memory that's really easy to read, write, and also to have long-range contact. Uh, this standard works uh, even like 10 to 15 centimeters when you don't have large antennas, so I don't have to get like really close to him. Uh, there's also ISO 18092, and that's like the NFC standard, and you don't see it anywhere. Like everybody calls everything like NFC, and when it comes to NFC, it's really nowhere. Uh, the only card that I know that supports this standard is uh, Felica cards from Sony, and nobody here probably heard about it. At least I didn't until like a few months ago. Sorry? Really? I didn't know about that. Thank you, thank you for the information. There's probably some people like who know a lot more about me here in terms of RFID. But uh, if anybody wants to teach me something, you're also welcome to come, not only if you want to, to, to learn something. Uh, Again, the, the, the crazy Proxmark 3. Uh, this time I'll talk about why it's so much different than all of the others. Uh, it pretty much has uh, ground, on, ground up uh, open source implementation of everything on it. Uh, so we are able to modify anything we want. And that's the main reason, because the uh, main reason it can talk to a lot of different cards. A lot of other devices like, for example, Flipper or Chameleon, use proprietary chips that only support uh, hard, uh, hardware-enabled uh, communication to specific standards. For example, we are not able to implement at all uh, uh, communication from Flipper to some type of the cards because the chip just doesn't support it. That's the easy way to make a reader, but it's not really po powerful. Uh, Proxmark 3 has a like, really steep learning curve and it's considered more like a research platform but I would still recommend uh, people to get one if they want to get like deep in the in the RFID stuff. If you just want to clone something, I would like uh, suggest figuring out what the car type of the cart is and then just getting the proper like cloner for the type of the cart. Uh, we'll talk about uh, which uh, devices support reading, writing, or emulating of which type of uh, of uh, HF cards. Uh, but be warned that. Uh, Yes doesn't mean yes always, uh, especially for emulation, because it is really hard to get timings uh, right for the emulation. Uh, the readers expect a uh, really, really fast response from cards, and it is really hard to do that on the embedded devices. Uh, also, there are a lot types of di uh, different cards, so it's not like easy to implement emulation for all of them, reading or writing also. Uh, there's a series of uh, chameleons, mini and tiny. These two devices, but you should probably come later to see how they look cl near, close by. 
Uh, they are able to emulate a lot of different HF cards, but they have some uh, timing issues and uh, it will sometimes work with some readers, in it won't work, so unless you have like a reader, you have tested it and you, you know you'll be using it, it with it, I, I don't re recommend getting uh, that version of Chameleon. There's Chameleon Ultra, but right now it only supports MyFair Classic, so don't get it either unless you know what you're doing. In the future, expect they'll be releasing a lot more features, uh, and maybe at that point it will be worth it. And the thing about uh, Ultra is that it has really fast response time, so it's showing some potential for future improvement, and maybe it will work with a lot more readers. We also have a Flipper Zero again, of course. Uh, it can be really finicky with emulation. It's not just the timing. It sometimes has some like RF issues. Some t some signals do not look correct. So, if you do not have to use it for for emulation for HF, I recommend getting something else. Of what? Of course, it is a great multi-tool, but it's not uh, nearly as good as Proxmark for stuff like HF. Uh, we have long-range readers. Don't worry, I won't be coming near you again. Uh, and we have uh, some, uh, oops, some readers that we have an open-source way of talking to. For example, PN PN532 or NDL533N. Uh, so basically, you can just download uh, libnfc. There are versions that are connected to USB. You just plug in USB and uh, start libnfc and it will work with the commands that are implemented in LibNFC. Now we are finally to the weird stuff, UHF cards. Uh, as I said, if you have seen uh, like H&M uh, tags or something like that, you have probably already seen like weird shape antennas. They are pretty much one standard that dominates the market. It is ISO 18000. Finally, something that's really standardized. It has unique ID as all other cards, but somebody just decided it should be called a TID in this case. You have no idea why. Uh, its main feature is that it has readable memory and that's mostly used for inventory management system. People store something called EPC inside of it and it's pretty much like serial uh, number for that item. Uh, does anybody have any questions regarding cards? We are back. N look, we are coming to next chapter, so I want to clear up any confusion. Like, how far you can read the last card that you said? UHF. Yes. Uh, active cards like few hundred meters, and uh, passive cards like I've even seen demos where people read them through the wall. I have a really good reader that, of course, left in my backpack, but I can show you the demo <laughs> where I read the, the card through the wall. Okay. And it can be like a few meters. And really cool stuff about UHF is that you can read a lot of them with, uh, within the same range. They have really good anti-collision. Uh, and they, they are the readers like Motorola one that r works really, really fast. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, how good is RFID shielding with these cards? Uh, how much can it block? You would be surprised how many products I actually purchased and they were like complete garbage. <laughs> so uh, there are some active uh, anti-RFID like uh, RFID protections for example there's a card that just sends garbage in the air on the frequency that it's getting and that's probably the best protection I've seen so far. I, I was actually at a black hat last year and somebody was giving it uh, like RFID protectors as a gift. I tested it and it's, it's just a plastic it changed nothing. <laughs> Uh, fun fact, if you're playing with RFID, don't do it like on a metal surface. I was like debugging some issue for hours and I was sitting at a metal, on the metal bench and it just didn't work. Uh, so we are 
Uh, any other questions? And what about aluminum foil? Like wrap your cards with it? Uh, as far as I know, you have to be really careful how far it is from the card, depending on of the wavelength. But that, that's something you should probably like test with a real reader. Any other questions? Uh, that's really good question. For LF, it should mostly work for HF. Uh, some of the technologies have uh, anti-collision. For example, ISO one. I shouldn't translate it. It's the one that starts with one five. Uh, it does have really good anti-collision, but not all of the readers support anti-collision. Uh, th that's one more point. If you use like a reader that's like desktop reader, it will probably read all, all of the cards. But uh, generally, the access control ones uh, stop after reading the, the first one as an anti brute force technique. Uh, any more questions, or I can. Uh, I'm so sorry, uh, I was absent at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, but uh, I would like to know um, on what principle uh, that readers, uh, um, in a terms of physics, uh, do work. Uh, there's something called magnetic induction that's used for to power the cards. Uh, reader is sending the data to cards by turning off the field. Uh, cards has built-in uh, capacitor and it uses it to maintain the power to stay awake while uh, the field is off. And it can measure the time uh, the field is off. And to modulate the data back from the card, from the card to reader, it just uh, turns on the, the load inside of the card and uh, changes the, the voltage on the uh, reader's uh, antenna. Yeah. So if you measure the voltage across the antenna, you'll see the different voltage when the, there's a capacitor that's put in, in the circuit on the card. Yeah. Thank you. If you want to know anything else, I'll be outside uh, with the demo box. Uh, can we go keep going? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, when it comes to controllers, uh, we'll take a look at them in the way that they're like a black box. Uh, and we look at the common features. They commonly have input signal that's either vegan or SDP. And uh, they have output for audiovisual feedback. For example, if I read a card, it will like beep and uh, have a visual sign. And uh, it also has a control for a relay that unlocks the door. In this case, uh, I have a LED strip connected instead of the instead of a standard lock. Uh, I'll talk about vegan now. In this case, I connected the logic analyzer to the wires of uh, vegan. Uh, vegan has two data wires and uh, it's not what you think usually when you have two wires it's a two-way communication. But it, this is just all standard. If somebody wants to know why it works this way, I can explain later outside. Uh, it basically sends high signal on one or other wire, and it's one, uh, it's a zero or a one. You'll be able to see in the next slide how it actually works. This is the preview of data from uh, logic analysis software, and you can see we have uh, pin zero and pin one, and you can see spikes in the voltage. And those uh, are like represented by da data above. Uh, data on wire zero is it means it's zero, and data on wire one it means it's one. I have put the data from uh, logic analyzer into a calculator for 26-bit format, and we have the the data about the cards. Uh, the important thing to know about Vigant is it's a really stupid one-way protocol and it's not able to convey any uh, security features. So you can have two cards, for example, me for a classic one and this one that basically have the same Vigant ID but they are completely different cards with different IDs, different technologies. This is LF card, this is HF card. But if I read them both on the reader that supports multiple technologies, this one, they'll both unlock the door. It's of course secure, we'll talk about why later. 
so let's get to to attacks of the the cards. The most common attack, of course, is cloning the cards, and that's something that, that can be really easy, easily done in the field uh, with a lot of this. Uh, we have also seen hard coded credentials because why no? There's no like that there's like no saying like no security by obscurity a lot of the credentials of course leaked <laughs> we have seen even like fuzzing attacks work who would have thought that like low level languages can have memory issues uh, we have seen downgrade attacks like this one and we have also seen at ccc uh, some cryptographic attacks uh, there's a protocol called Crypto One that's used on MIFARE Classic cards, and it's broken like I think since 2008, and people like still completely rely on MIFARE Classic. Like if you have a hotel card with you, it's probably MIFARE Classic or even worse MIFARE Ultralight. Uh, vegan sniffing and reply is a really cool one. Uh, a lot of these readers are really li easy to take from the wall, for example. That's it. <laughs> and uh, any ideas about a small chip that like has a Wi-Fi and a few digital GPO pins? This is vegan uh, implant. It's ESP key. There's also open source version like that's called ESP tool. What it does is you use the power that's coming to reader. Uh, you use the crimping tool to put the to put the wires into a vampire connections it takes uh, parasitic like electricity from the device you also put the data zero data one uh, lines for vegans and what you can do is like record uh, all the cards that are used to open the door uh, you can also do a replay attack for example you can just connect to wi-fi come with a dummy card press send on the on the phone and it will magically unlock the door uh, if you use it long enough you can like figure out who is for example using the the card at which time and if you see like a guy at 5 am like using card each every 10 minutes you know it's a card and that card will work on every door probably <laughs> that's the 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 master card uh, and also the last thing is some more stuff from China. I'm really like, I r really feel bad about this one because it's all over the Serbia. We'll come to that. A card coded default credential, as I already said, uh, people probably put some credentials in for testing and like forgot to remove them or just didn't care. Flipper has, uh, for example, a really good word, word list of default credentials and you can just like approach with a flipper, uh, adjust the timing of how long the reader doesn't accept new credentials and it will just go through the list and a lot of times, at least in Serbia for buildings, it will open the, the door. Uh, a lot of them have been, of course, leaked, who would have thought. Fuzzing attacks. Uh, I've seen multiple readers that if I send all zeros or all one inside inside of ID, they just magically open. I didn't even try to reverse it; like it's just mine. Who would have thought that somebody would produce cards with changeable ID and like people would be able to try to to enter them into credentials? Controller and reader combo attacks, and this is the good stuff and the bad stuff. Imagine it is still closed. Uh, now you have seen the insides of the, the reader, but what you might not know. Oh, there's this button that's usually on the inside of the building, door exit, that unlocks the door. But the crazy thing is that it is the, the, 
the yellow wire. Fuck, where's my jumper? Uh, sad news is I forgot my jumper while I was testing some other stuff. But if you like, put the the wire into a connection a connector of a yellow wire and short it to the ground, it will open. <laughs> but the crazy thing is you don't even have to open the, the, the reader. As you can see, there's a, you probably can't see, but trust me, there's a re relay. Does somebody know what the relay is? <laughs> so if we close the reader, <laughs> and somebody for some reason just decided to put the controller in the same box as the reader because it was probably like easier to install and some money saving. <laughs> if somebody wants to see the, the attack with the wire, they can also come there. I, I had the demo box die on me, so I used uh, the, the jumper to test something and I, I lost it somewhere. Prob maybe it's even like in here. Nope. And of course, they have left unused wires for vegan inside of this reader. So even with the one that doesn't use vegan, you can still like use vegan implants. You can just remove it and connect the, the, the reader to, to the green and the white one. Uh, when it comes to uh, removing the readers from the walls, uh, this one, for example, the, the, the black one, he has uh, a sensor and it triggers alarm when it's removed, but like 99% of the time it's not even connected to anything. And in case of my really high-end controller, it just like saves information in the log that it, it has been tampered with and that's it. So like it has no obvious way to disable the reader it, if it was tampered with or something similar in that matter. So I have a picture of the attack. Good thing because uh, I lost jumper. You just jam the, the wire, the jumper into a socket for a yellow wire. For some reason, this is the first time Chinese people have decided to actually have a standard when it matters for security reasons. <laughs> for some reason, it's always yellow wire. Uh, here you can see that, uh, of course, I didn't lie about the, the relay. It's this thing. My hand is a bit shaky, sorry. And I have a bonus for all of you. You remember me mentioning a uh, card can be ridden through, through a wall or like really long distance? Uh, there's a standard called GS1 and it's really common. Does anybody here know what UPC is? Uh, if you have any kind of a barcode on anything you've purchased, it's probably UPC standard and it has two parts. It has company prefix and uh, uh, item type for that specific item. For example, if you have bought, bought two the, of the same t-shirts, ha they have the same uh, barcode. And uh, there's something introduced by GS1 that's called G uh, EPC. Uh, the, di the main difference between UPC and EPC is that EPC has a different serial number for each instance of like item. There's a company prefix item, item reference number like with UPC and also a number at the end that represents the serial number of that specific item. Uh, the crazy thing is that it's trivial to read those from uh, UHF tags, they have no protection, and if you like take the data and look at them up in the table, you can know the, the company that produced the item. Uh, and a lot of companies have a public way to look up EPCs and figure out what kind of item it is, so you can probably like come to somebody's place, like sweep with UHF reader uh, and see what they have inside of their house. 
who would find like that kind of imp information useful, except maybe, I don't know, thieves. <laughs> So now they, they, they have a, a way to calculate how expensive your clothes are. So if you, if you like want to brag, you can probably find the, the, the IDs from like some Gucci uh, stuff and like create uh, tags using the, the magic tags. I have some of them here. I'll show them to you later. Uh, of course, I would never disclose like a private API from a company for looking up the number. I just left the best <laughs> by accident on the... Uh, so, if you are like really good at writing, you can like uh, retype it or you can just download the presentation. Uh, Uh, if you want to join the community, I just recommend joining Iceman Discord or going to RFID Research Group uh, GitHub. Uh, that's pretty much it. I have some demos if I have some time left, but probably we should use that, that time for uh, questions and go for demos on like later today and tomorrow on the meeting room. Any questions? So you touched a bit on uh, here. You touched a bit on emulators and not being able to talk with some of the readers. Um, I've seen a different different problem. So for LF uh, EM four thousand and hundred, um, I've seen that if you write all zeros to to the tag, um, many readers will not read it. But if you emulate all zeros, they will. Do you know why is that? Because I have no idea. I, I I guess it's probably about detection of the data from readers. I, uh, I I think it's about how the data is modulated. Did they just see it probably as a bug because there's nothing like uh, modulated on, on, on the load of the, the carrier, if I remember correctly for EM4100. Is there any law about the RFID and how do you protect it? How do you protect yourself as a it, researcher? It, is there a law? Uh, well, you are reverse engineering stuff, so is there a law against it? <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you said it all. When it comes to law, if, if anybody wants like pirated standards, you can come talk to me. Uh, they are usual, you have to buy them, they are not NDA, but they are like really expensive and I have some of them, like a computer I can <laughs> fix you up. Uh, does, this, does this work? Uh, the tag that you mentioned that contains the UPC and EPC, which which tag is that on a product? UHF. Uh, UHF. Is that like the little sticker that's? Uh, it's the, it's the one with wiggly lines, weird antenna shape. Yeah, but that's that's usually taken off when you buy the product, right? So no one can like uh, scan. Not it. really. For example, if you buy something at H uh, and M, it will stay on on the product. But also, uh, you mean you take the the tag off? Uh, yeah, and also there are some uh, products that like uh, keep them inside for verification of authenticity. So expensive stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the stuff the thieves the, care about. The stuff we're interested in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the example of a magic uh, UHF tag. It has TID changeable, not UID, TID. TID. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? One question about the UHF tags. Uh, wh wh what are the frequencies and how do you read uh, them? Like they, they are really weird ones because uh, at that point, uh, at that high of frequency, signals can propagate really far from the readers, so they are regulated by local laws. And uh, in Europe and in the US, uh, they use the different frequency. In Europe, I think it's somewhere between 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz, and they are multiple standards, like they, they don't overlay with mobile networks.
Okay, you don't need to answer this question if you don't want to. What is the purpose of the chip inside your hand? Uh, I just think it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I just come to the door in office and I like open the door and people are like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> people in the into RFI, they are just weird, like, why can't you accept it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's really small. It it won't uh, like show up on any metal detectors. It's safe to get enter MRI with it. It's like it's really small. It's like two uh, rice, like uh, two pieces of rice, like combined in the, in the land. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how large is an ID? Uh, like how long would it take to brute force with something? Uh, uh, brute force attacks are usually not uh, practical, uh, only fuzzing attacks are practical, practical. and uh, for example, if you have one of LF hides, they are, uh, they have a known standard for like facility ID and user ID, and a lot of times cards are just like incremented. So if you have a card with low privileges, you can just attempt inc incrementing numbers and getting the one with the higher privilege. Any other questions? Uh, have you played around with uh, credit cards when it comes to reading? <laughs> and if yes, uh, have you noticed the differences between Visa cards and MasterCards? For example, you mentioned Flipper. Uh, there are different behaviors when it comes to uh, reading MasterCard and Visa. Like Visa seems like more open. It will really show the credit card ID and Ma MasterCard usually doesn't do that. Uh, honestly, I didn't play much with uh, credit cards, but uh, I know about there being a common uh, implementation for a Java Smart Card applet between those, those two, and I think it's called EMV. And as a, as a fire, as I know, uh, it's not really, uh, it's not a simple protocol. It's, it's mostly secure. Uh, keys actually never leave the card card just signs the transaction and then transaction is being sent to the to the bank bank has public I, uh, key of the card and it can verify the transaction but the credit card the, the, does give out in some cases the ID of the card yeah 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 uh, you get the, the ID full name but you don't get the CVC number that's the number on the behind so you can't just read the card and like, use it online you have to also have the three digits or four digits. I don't know different standards. Like, any other questions? Um, sorry to budge in. There is a 9:35 talk from me about that later on. So, yeah. <laughs> it's about how to do all the card things, how to steal the money. So, come, we have to talk. I will. Any other questions? Uh, in terms of Flipper trying different codes to unlock the, the readers, uh, how does it know when the reader is alive again? Uh, you mean a uh, fuzzing attacks, yes. force attacks? Yes. Uh, you, you have to manually set the delay between changing the IDs. It doesn't know. Because field mostly stays on constantly. Any other questions? Did you try to find ha uh, fellow hackers by scanning for uh, Balkan t-shirts? Uh, or any other t-shirts? Do, do they have UHF tags? No, I'll try, I didn't. So you didn't try to, to socialize, shame on you. <laughs> VRFID guards are weird, so. Most of the things you mentioned are about, I don't know, scanning the cards really quickly. But assuming that the card is misplaced for a certain amount of time, how much time or how much effort would it take to make an actual clone one-to-one? -one? Uh, it really depends on the type of the cards because uh, for some cards that have uh, some kind of authentication, you also need access to the reader to extract the keys. There are a lot of different kinds of attacks. You can sometimes like, Yes, the key only based on the communication from card to do to uh, 
uh, bad uh, random number generation uh, algorithm. You can sometimes get the, get the keys only from the reader. You can sometimes sniff the traffic and based on the handshake figure out the keys. But uh, if you have only access to the card and card uh, is uh, card has the features that allow you to get guess the keys or doesn't have authentication, you can clone the cards really like fast, like seconds, no, not minutes. Sorry. Yeah, of course. That. Sorry, one to one. Uh, what do you mean by one to one? Uh, if you don't have a way to extract data and if you don't have a card that you can program, no. As far as I know, there are no attacks like that. I um, was looking into long range readers and uh, Bishop Fox, I think, did some work on that like about five or six years ago. Have you heard? Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, they yeah. have a vegan logger and a uh, long range reader. They power it by batteries, they save the vegan data, and later they can produce cards of the same tech if they have algorithm that can convert vegan to back to, to card data. I was about to uh, build that because they released um, the circuit design for that, um, and I was just going to start to build that. I just want, wondered uh, if you thought that was something that works pretty well. I mean, they claim it goes to uh, one meter. Uh, well, I mean, depending on, I mean, you get the, you, you buy like the large readers from the parking lot type size yeah. and you attach that. Uh, the, the biggest issue with uh, long range readers is that they mostly only support one kind of the tech. So you have to know which kind of card you're going to be reading. You can buy a specific long range reader for that card. Uh, you need a way to power the reader and you can just use something like ESP key to, to log the vegan data. Okay, yeah, because that was what they were saying that um, it will accept obviously any any reader that speaks Wigan and you just have yeah, to buy yeah, that course. and it's a couple hundred bucks but I guess yeah. You, yeah. there are also antennas for Proxmark that are somewhat long range and you can also use them for, for reading you don't have like to, to have a setup that's exactly like that okay thanks any other questions I think Tesla uses cards to open it if you don't have an app. So can you clone that card and uh, steal I, Teslas? I think they use a smart puppet. I don't know if it was broken yet. I know some people uh, actually melted cards and created the implant, so it's probably not practical to clone. Okay. Like melt card, like uh, use a different kind of wire to make like uh, the, uh, the, the other type of antenna and like inject it into under the skin. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you for being here. I would also like to thank my colleagues once again for helping me and coming here and listening for me like speak fifth time because I used to practice in the office. I would like to thank organizers of Balkon for helping me be able to speak for a first time on a conference that I was like since the beginning on. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for listening to me. And I would like to apologize about like how chaotic I was, there's a lot of manage, a lot of demos, a lot of devices, so it was like kind of hard to keep up with everything. And also in switching from Wayland to X server because Wayland doesn't support screen mirroring, I was like managing presentation in two different instances of P PDF reader and like making sure I was synchronized with the, the, the presentation and the, what they have on the screen. <laughs> Thank you.